these guys are under a time constraint. They are rushing their butts off, trying to make the best weapon they can. Right. And sometimes small things get neglected or missed or overlooked. So, and I, I, I hate it. I tell people all the time, I don't want to break your stuff. I really don't. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 34 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from the KnifeJunkie.com. Hey, Jim, happy Father's Day. Hey, Bob, happy Father's Day to you. And the reason we say that is that today's episode drops or comes out, is published on Father's Day. So if you're listening on Father's Day, happy Father's Day. If you're listening on any other day of the year, it's just any other day of the year, right, Bob? <laughs> That's right. But if you're a father, be proud of it. Doesn't That's matter right. what day it is. Could be Enjoy your night. Father's Day, whatever day. Yeah, because, you know, it only comes around once a year, so we need to take advantage of it. I like to say in my family, you know, that it's Father's Day week or Father's Day weekend or whatever I can do to kind of stretch it out a little well, that's, bit. That sounds good. And, and you know, every day it's like Father's Day. My kids say this morning, Father's Day, when's Kids Day? And of course, I used to say that to my parents and the never ending refrain is every day is Kids Day. This is for me. Today is for that's me. That's right. That's right. <laughs> where's my steak? Ooh, I like that steak. Uh, speaking of Father's Day, if you didn't catch uh, last week's show, episode number 33, that was uh, Bob's Father's Day fantasy knife list. So I can't wait to uh, have a discussion on episode 35 next week to see if any Father's Day fantasy knife list items comes into your possession. Yeah, we're recording this in the morning, Jim, and we, we haven't had dessert. We haven't had dinner, dessert, or presents yet. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I'm assuming there are presents. <laughs> and uh, I don't, we'll see. We'll see if my wife listened to uh, listen to the last episode. We'll see all right, all right. just how savvy she is. Or maybe she came up with other ideas that, that didn't make your list. Who knows? <laughs> hey, you know, that, that could be. We'll see. You'll, we'll you'll see. take what you can get, right? <laughs> Do want to uh, mention that today's episode is uh, brought to you by Audible. And we certainly do appreciate uh, their sponsorship of the podcast. And if you like listening to Audible, I want to remind you that you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, your Android, your Kindle, your MP3 player. Again, just go to audibletrial.com slash knife junkie and you can catch up with uh, all kind of audio in addition to the Knife Junkie podcast. Bob, a uh, cool interview on uh, this show today, uh, one that I, you know, I say this a lot. It seems like a lot of the folks you interview, you really uh, enjoy, you want to talk to them, you can't wait to meet them. But uh, another example on uh, on this week's show. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this week's show, we talk with uh, Jay Nielsen, who's an ABS Mastersmith and judge of uh, the show, the history show Forged in Fire. And uh, he's uh, he's the judge who always sits uh, to the far left, and he tests these knives so hard. But uh, we had a great conversation, and we learned that he doesn't actually take any pleasure out of uh, some of the damage that sometimes is inflicted on the knives. But that's the whole point of the show. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're you're in a time crunch. How well can you forge a blade in a, in a time crunch? I think it's assumed that every smith on that show, given uh, given all the time they need, can come up with a fantastic knife. But in three hours, what can you produce? Right. And uh, I think it's a great show. It's done amazing things for the for the knife world. It's done amazing things for television, if you ask me. And um, it was a, a great pleasure to talk to Jay Nielsen. Well, and again, Forged in Fire uh, airs on the History Channel, I think, Wednesdays at uh, 9 p.m. Yes, sir. And um, what is it? And it's like seventh or eighth season, something like that. Seventh was, season, yeah. Wrapping that right now. Definitely uh, had uh, good longevity, which uh, means a lot of folks are watching it and enjoying it. So uh, the popularity is there. And uh, good interview. Good yeah. interview as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well. Without any further ado, let's get into that and hear Jay Nielsen, Forged in Fire, with Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Call the Knife Junkie at 724-466-4487 with your questions or comments. I want to talk to you a little bit about Forged in Fire, but I also want to talk to you about your mass, being a, a master smith and what it took to get there. And I want to hear about your process. I want to talk a little bit about you know, um, your creative process and that kind of thing. 
whatever whatever you're going to do is much safer than what I was doing today. So I'm I'm cool with it. You emailed me before and said we're good to go tonight. Uh, got off early, broke some things. What was that all about? Uh, yeah, uh, I do, I tell the Smiths all the time I do not like breaking their weapons, whether it's you know in round three or in the finale. Um, but it happens. You know these guys are in a time crunch. Nobody is making their best work on the show. I mean, you know, it's a game show. You got to you know do the best you can and run with it. So, you know, sometimes processes get slipped. You know, sometimes it's a blade. Sometimes it's a handle. Well, I'm, I'm going to break in by saying uh, the other night I watched the uh, Attila the Hun Mars sword. Uh, mm-hmm. one, one of the contestants, uh, it broke on a, on a I think it was a, a pot, a, um, a hanging ceramic pot, and it just shattered. And, oh, my gosh, it was, it was a beautiful, beautiful sword. And it seemed, you know, through the first kill test, it seemed to be, you know, pretty stout but i guess that's probably why you do the kill test first because you're going into soft materials and stuff like that and uh, you need to get as much tv out of it as you can uh, before the blade has the possibility to break but seeing that that uh, attila the hun sword break was was heartbreaking so what happened to you today uh today well i can't tell you exactly what happened because no, the episodes no. haven't aired but right yeah you know, we had one sword you know blade break uh, which has happened a couple times and you know kind of I've learned to duck quickly because it kind of tends to come back right at me. And then we had a handle failure. So, I mean, it can be the blade or the handle. Um, like I said, these guys are under a time constraint. They are rushing their butts off, trying to make the best weapon they can. Right. And sometimes small things get neglected or missed or overlooked. So, and I, I, I hate it. I tell people all the time, I don't want to break your stuff. I really don't. I mean, you know, we, we goof around on set and we giggle and I come up rubbing my hands and smile and, Right, you right. know, but that's that's just to mess with people. That's that's yeah. honestly just who I am. I, I like to around talk. with people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got to do it. Well, my my wife. Okay, my wife and I and my parents are devotees to this show. Actually, uh, uh, I, d- I used to work in fashion, and so I used to watch um, Project Runway with my wife, and I used to say they should make this, but for knives, like guys making knives. And it seemed like a fantasy. This was 15 years ago, 20 years or er, 10 years ago. And here comes Forged in Fire. It's like my dream show. My wife uh, is a particular fan of how sincere you are when you're testing. And, uh, you, you know, you can tell you don't like it when something breaks, but you really go out and, and give, it, give it its due. Yeah. Um, well, I tell the Smiths, you know, I total respect for them because we do get to talk to them for a very short time when they're reading the rules you know, before we start. And I tell them, it's like, look, you know, I respect all of you for coming on here. But I'm going to hold them back because I probably was testing my stuff this way before you guys ever lit your first forge. So, I mean, I, if I do it to my stuff and, you know, a lot of people don't realize that we've done, well, we're up to seven seasons now. And like the first four or five, we were doing all kinds of crazy testing um, that never even made it on the show. You used to use a lot of machines, I remember. We did. More we so, did. simple machines and such. Yeah, we got a couple coming up. But, uh, you know, but a lot of the stuff early on, we would test and, you know, they would line up a board, you know, a long board full of chains and cables and say, Jay, take your knife and go hacking through all these things. <sighs> and I'd be like, I'm swinging away and I'm chopping and stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, I hate you guys. You're not my friends. I hate you all. You... <laughs> I mean, there was tons of stuff that never even made it. Tons of testing never made on the show. So, you know, sometimes these guys get off easy. Not very often, but but I'm, yeah, I love them to death. But I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna hold back on stuff. I'm gonna test no, the no, same I, way I would test my own stuff. You're not gonna be the coach barking orders uh, from a from a golf cart. You're, you're gonna no, be in actually. There. I would love to do that during round one and two. Though. I would love because <laughs> yeah. sometimes you just want to sit there and scream out, "No, don't do that." I, I love it. I love it. It's like uh, it's like. Have you never seen the show? Do you not know that you never use water? I mean, come on. I, I actually set up a little booby trap. Uh, tomorrow in the green room because we're starting a new episode Mm -hmm. so the the pa that takes care of the smiths she's lining up all five of my instructional dvds and putting a sign up says did you watch these before you came here you should have (laughs) just again just because i like messing with people right on just just to get in their head a little bit well how'd you how'd you get involved with the show in the first place uh it was funny because we had heard you know me and the you know the knife makers in the community 
had heard for a couple of years that, you know, somebody's somebody's talking about making a show, you know, about forged blades and stuff like that. And I was like, you know, we're all like, oh, OK, well, we'll see what happens. And I was actually forging blades in my shop when I got a phone call. And this, you know, nice woman, girl, whatever, is on the phone. She goes, oh, I'm so-and-so from the History Channel. And we're thinking about doing a knife forging competition. Would you be interested? And my first reply was, okay, who are you really? Because I thought <laughs> it was one of my Smith buddies' wives or girlfriends calling me up there trying to prank me uh, just because we like doing that to each other. Yeah. It took her probably about a good five, six minutes to convince me she was actually from history. <laughs> and uh, she was like, would you be interested? And I was like, I don't know, reality TV and, you know, it's, you know, this is our livelihood. And she goes, well, we were thinking about having you be a judge. And I was like, oh, well, that sounds like a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm in. <laughs> hey, so, and what actually, it's funny you mentioned Project Runway. One of the things that actually hooked me was they said the format for Forge and Fire was based on Chopped, oh, the yeah. cooking show. Mm-hmm. And me and my wife watch Chopped all the time. That's right. one of the things we like doing because we live out in the sticks. So we, cook around stuff and uh, that that was kind of the hook for me i was like okay knife making maybe we can actually teach people something and i get to meet the guy who directed chopped cool yeah you you fit into that format that's perfect so what what has the show from your perspective done for the knife world before the first season aired um it made me a pariah yeah because everybody had heard about it heard we were shooting it um, I went to a couple of knife shows and I had other knife makers that I had known for years flat out cursing me. Say, like, what are you doing? You're an idiot. You're going to make us all look like idiots. You should not be doing this. Then after the first season aired, because you know, you know, when we first started, you know, nobody doing the show really knew much about knife making. I mean, I was, you know, the, the guy that was doing it every day mm-hmm. and they, the TV people, you know, I love them to death, but they were like, how do we add drama? I was like, no, 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 no. Put, Trust put a me. bucket of water do, on the set. <laughs> yeah, you do not need to add drama. Just let these guys go. They will make all the drama you want. And they were like, okay, well, let's see. And after the first couple episodes, they were like, okay, you were right. We don't have to add anything. Yeah, so, it's perfect. Uh, and yeah, after the first season aired, and especially after the second season aired, I had people coming back to me and apologizing because their knife sales had gone up. Their classes for teaching knife making had had gone up. You know, the industry, I mean, you know, granted, we got a lot of new knife makers now. But if you're established and you've been around for a long time, you've got a reputation. So it's not like you're competing against all these new knife makers. So, I mean, it made it was a boost on the industry itself. Yeah. And if you're if you've already been making knives, you're already, you know, however many years in with experience, you're you're not starting fresh like uh, like the guy. Well, like myself, I don't I don't forge knives, but I occasionally put her around with stock removal at home, you know, and and every time since I don't do it every day, I feel like I'm starting from scratch. So uh, you've got your time in and then a show like Forged and Fire comes along. I could see how it could really boost your sales, boost just interest in general. And now it's not like, oh, knives. You'd be like, knives, you're a psycho. It's it's something different. It, it's funny you say that because for years, because I've been making knives for, God, over 25 years. And I actually started out with stock removal. It wasn't until uh, Damascus started making a resurgence that you know I decided I wanted to do that. So I, I learned to forge. But yeah, I would go you know, hang out with people and, you know, go to like, you know, gatherings and stuff like that. And I live in Pennsylvania. I'd be sitting next to a gunsmith and people are like, oh, you're a gunsmith. Oh, that's so cool. What do you do? I make knives for a living. And they started looking at me like I'm Jeffrey Dahmer or something. <laughs> it's like, what the heck? This guy can kill you from five miles away. I have to be right next to you. What? Why am I the nut? Oh my God. Yeah, that's funny. I, that's that's funny, man. I, I feel like, uh, I, I don't know, maybe it's just because uh, my head is always in it, but I feel like uh, knives in general, just, I mean, just from the office environment have become more acceptable. Uh, well, I know at least in my office environment, I've sort of pushed the issue, but I feel like more and more people are starting to carry knives again, as they always have for millennia. Right. No, I, I, I totally agree with the way you've phrased it. It's becoming more acceptable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I met, I've talked to people for years um, that, you know, they'd be in the office and they'd have a little, you know, little folding knife. They pop open to open packages and stuff like that. And people are like, oh, my God, you're carrying a knife. Now it's like, hey, what kind of knife are you carrying? Yeah, exactly. And that's great. That's great. And the fact that the uh, 
interest in knives has grown. You know, especially we have a we have a huge youth following. I get pictures and letters from kids all the time from the U.S. and from different countries. You know, and little pictures, little notes about, oh, I really love the show and it got me interested in, in photos of them building their little forges and stuff. And it's just amazing. It's like a resurgence. Wow. Well, that, that gives you hope, especially especially with what we were talking about before, you know, living computerized lives or screen lives. And oftentimes when we think of the younger generation, we think of, oh, God, they can't get their head out of their phone, you know. But it's so great to hear of uh, kids, you know, not just doing art, not just doing regular art, but making functional art. Well, at the same time, at the same time, I've gotten letters from parents that were like, thank you for doing the show. Uh, my kids used to be in the computers or in the video games constantly. And now I get to spend a couple of nights a week or the weekends in the garage puttering around with my, my kids. I'm actually spending more time with my kids because they're interested in making knives and they like the show. Wow. And that, you know, me having two kids of my own, that really makes me feel good. Yeah, I mean, it, it has to. If, if, you're, if you're adding meaning to someone else's life and you're actually, you know, through your own efforts and through doing what you love, adding a meaningful dimension to someone else's life and possibly helping to edge out a distraction that can be destructive, man, that's got to feel great. I mean, what, what more could you ask for from your livelihood? Well, I could ask for less hate mail. <laughs> you get hate mail. What kind of hate mail do you get? I get hate mail. I really do. I tell, even people on set, I tell them, I, well, tell you, I, guess, I guess I'll go back to the apartment and read some more hate mail. And they're like, really? It's like, yeah. I, <laughs> I get people like, you know, if Jay Nielsen doesn't like you, he's going to make sure he breaks your knife and <laughs> you know, he sets up impossible challenges for you. And it's, it's like, seriously? <laughs> I, tell, uh, I tell everybody, especially contestants, I said, look, I'm a nice guy. I really am. Deep down inside. Deep. Deep, deep down inside. <laughs> Very deep down inside. Hey, I, I'm going to quote my mother and say, if you just uh, took all that energy that you're putting into your hate mail and put it into your own career or your own, uh, you know, self improvement, you'd be you'd be a much better person. And Jay Nielsen exactly. would would have a you know a mailbox with with fan mail. Well, I figure it's just like sports. I mean, there's armchair quarterbacks, <laughs> so we got armchair bladesmiths. It's the same yeah. thing. I don't take any of it seriously. Matter of fact, all the stuff that's on like the social media, uh, I don't read any of it. Um, but on occasion, my wife will read it and tear into somebody. So that's yeah. You know, but they... oh yeah, she's probably way better at it than you are anyway. Oh, she she can be vicious. It's, I love her to death. She's <laughs> she's worse than I am. <laughs> so has being on the show, uh, like, well, what have you learned being on the show and 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 being a judge instead of the the person whose work is being judged? Uh, I've learned it's very frustrating watching other people do what I want to do. Mm. I, I constantly want to jump off the table and run down and you know help out and pitch in and stuff like that. But uh, no, one of the things I love, I, I tell everybody this, um, my favorite part of the show is not the testing. That's like second favorite. My favorite part of the show is like the first 15, 20 minutes of round one. Because Will reveals a challenge. I already know how I do it. And I want to see what they're going to do. And... There's a lot of times that, you know, Smith will do something completely off the wall. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way this is ever going to work. And then they make it work. And it's like, holy crap, I got to try that in my own shop. That's cool. Because, I mean, we're all, one of the analogies I have, we're all trying to get to the same destination. We all just take different paths to get there. Yeah, and you're at different stages. You know, obviously you're an ABS master Smith. You're way ahead of most of the people on that show, if not, if not all of them. But to be able to learn from a student, not that you're teaching them, but they are they are your juniors in that situation, and to be able to learn from them, that's pretty pretty uh, good. That's one of the things I love about knife making and bladesmithing. You're constantly learning. I mean, I, like I said, I've been doing this for 25 plus years, and there's still tons of stuff that I haven't done that I want to go try out and I want to experiment with and stuff like that. So that's one of the things that keeps you going. You know, there's always something new to play around with. Well, what is an ABS Master Smith, and what does it take to become one? Uh, well, first of all, you join the ABS. Um, you're an apprentice Smith, which you don't actually have to impre apprentice under anybody. Um, I didn't. Uh, I'm mostly self-taught, except for one very kind gentleman named Keith Bagley, who invited me down to his shop and showed me the basics of forging forge welding, and then kind of went, fly, little bird. And <laughs> I went back to Pennsylvania, and I beat my head against the wall a lot, but um, yeah, you join the ABS, you're an apprentice smith for three years, 
uh, then you can test for journeyman smith, which is you have to do a performance test and a judging. Uh, the performance test consists of forging a mono steel blade, single steel, 10 inches, no more than 10 inches long, no more than 15 inches overall with the handle, no more than two inches wide. You have to go to a master smith shop. You got three things you have to do. You have to cut a free hanging rope, one inch thick rope within four inches of the bottom. So there's no tension on it or anything. You have to whip right through it. Second, you have to chop a two by four and a half twice. And then you have to be able to shave hair off your arm on the spot that you are chopping. Then the flex test is when you clamp your blade a third of the way down into a vise and then hook a pipe on your handle and bend that blade past 90 degrees. Oof. Now you usually get right at, but usually a little bit past mm-hmm. and not, not break. It can crack a certain amount, but it can't break. Do they come back to true? Does it have to come back to straight? It doesn't have to come back. To, it usually, you know, we usually figure it's got to come back at least 30 degrees. Okay. So, I mean, you don't want to come out with a knife that's 90 degrees still. So it needs to come back to an extent. And then if you pass that, then you have to make five knives and go to, you know, one of the big shows like Atlanta, you know, Blade Show, West Blade Show East, and bring those five knives and have judged by other master smiths. And they give you a little bit of wiggle room, but, uh, you know, they're not terribly strict. I mean, if you got a couple issues that they can let you slide. And then from there, you got to wait two more years. Oh. Then if you want to, you can test for master smith which you do the exact same performance test, except this time it's with a Damascus blade, a minimum of 320 layers, and it's got to be hidden tang instead of a full tang. So uh, more of a refinement of skills required in that, would you say? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Huh. You know, doing that because, you know, you've got more body, more strength with a full tang, less with a hidden tang, and then the Damascus factor on top of it. Right, right. And 300, you said no less than 320 layers? Yes, no more less than 320 wow. layers. You know, at that point, it's, that's not a super high layer count. Um, and then you got to do the judging said, test I'm again. I'm sorry, you said that is not a super high layer count, right? Oh, no. I mean, on average, guys nowadays are doing, you know, 350 to 600 layers on a regular wow. basis. My nudge. Okay. Actually, once you, once you get a certain layer count, like say you get up to 150 layers, you cut it three times, then you know you, you're okay. You know, jumping up quickly. So it's like once you get your base layer count, it it picks up quickly. So so then after that, after your uh, after your second um, trip to the blade show with the five knives, then you get kind of jumped in. Uh, well, the big thing about the second judging for Master Smith is you have to make a Damascus European fluted dagger. Oh fluted wire inlay handle. That sounds easy. <laughs> Every yeah, anything else you can make whatever you want, right. but that's a requirement. And if you yes. remember the episode of yes. the show yes. where they had a fluted dagger, yes, that I was did. actually the dagger I used to pass my master smith. Oh, was that mentioned in the show? I don't remember that. I don't remember if it was or not, but I know the gentleman who purchased it from me. Uh-huh. So I reached out to him and said, "Hey, want to see it on TV?" I got to say that was uh, one of the better looking specimens. Where, where do those weapons come from? Uh, which ones? The the ones for the finale? Yeah, yeah. Your your sample, you know, now go uh, home and Dave, make this. Dave Baker makes those. Oh, my God. Yeah, Dave, make, Dave makes those. He makes all the finale demo weapons. And uh, you think our smiths are under time constraints? Baker's on a oh, lot more. Oh, my God. But Dave's a, Dave's a master of, like, workarounds. And, and, you know, Dave's been making swords and prop weapons for 30 years. So right. you know he he can knock out the stuff that stuff that we send the contestants home to make he can usually knock out in half the time. What? So you've you've uh, you've reduced the amount of time contestants have to to make by one day, right? Now they uh, yeah they some have of the days. some of the couple the next episodes you'll see that instead of five days at the home forge it's four days, and we've cut, also cut back on some of the handle rounds instead of three hours it's two hours. Yes, I, I've noticed that too. So what's that about? Where it was. Was the three hours too much? Too much luxury? Um, actually, no, because it just gets it. It stresses the Smiths out more. Oh. Um, and it was just it was just to see. And we tried it out at first with a, a couple of the round two challenges that weren't too bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I thought they could do it. I mean, I I was I had no problem in my mind thinking they could do it. And we've noticed since we started doing it, the quality of the handles and such really hasn't dropped at all. 
the Smiths just move faster. Interesting. They yeah, they they just have less to. So it seems like a a real fun set. Is I mean, you know, I follow you and I follow uh, uh Doug Markaida and uh etc on uh on Instagram and uh, you guys post some fun looking pictures, I got to say. It it looks like a blast. Doug Doug's Doug's the comedian on the set. He's he's the, probably the most deadly guy on the set, but he's also the big goofball. <laughs> right, right. Like he's He's talked. He's talked to me and says, Jay, lay down, lay down, dude. Let me take a picture. Why? No, no, lay down. He just did one today. He goes, Jay, bend over. I said, Doug, I'm not bending over in front of you. No, no, Jay, I just find you for a funny picture. I said, I'm not comfortable with this, Doug. <laughs> but yeah, he's the biggest comedian. It's funny when we did the pilot, we went out to Seattle, and none of us knew each other at all. And I'm sitting in this room, you know, full of tongs and power hammers and stuff like that, at a table, fold out table with Doug. Again, not knowing who he was or anything. Right. And he's sitting there with his camera just snapping photos constantly. And I'm just looking at him. And he looks me dead in the eye. He goes, hey, what do you want? I'm Asian. I said, <laughs> okay, I can, I can deal with this guy. He's got a good sense of humor. Right. <laughs> I like right. him. Oh, man. So I've been I've been doing Kali for um, a long time. And, and he's always been one of, the, one of the names that's always floating around uh, just as being – Outstanding, and and not only, and I have never uh, taken a, a seminar with him, but uh, I, I know someone who has, and you know, has nothing but great things to say about him. And so I, I have to say, like, I love what the show has done for knives and acceptance. I also love what it's done for Kali and the acceptance right. of bladed weapon martial arts. When I watch you test, it seems like you have some skills as well. Uh, uh, you're, it doesn't look like you're just uh, you know, swinging for the, for the fences. looks like you're swinging hard, but you also look like you have some technique. Have you done some, some sort of formal training? No, I did karate when I was a kid, but no, never any edge stuff. Again, it's mostly self-taught. Um, it's, just, it's just the fact that because I was self-trained for the most part, I was very insecure about what I was doing when I started out with. Um, so I would test like crazy. I mean, I, I would, when I started out, if I had a bend that had a little crack in it or a warp or the handle scale was pulled away or something like that, I would take that knife out in the woods and PA and beat the living hell out of it. And it's just using your knives. Um, like we make, there's the comments getting made all the time that when I'm doing chopping on the show, I chop and I turn my head away to the left. And it's not anything that I trained myself to do. It's probably just a little voice in the back of my head saying, don't get hit with anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, the, no, there's no formal training. Um, there's just a, a lot of experience with testing because, I, like I said, I've been doing this to my own knives for years. And uh, there's probably a little bundle of rage buried in me somewhere. <laughs> probably. <laughs> But I got I got to I got a place to vent it so. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, it's perfectly productive and and everyone gains from it. So there's nothing wrong with that. Hey, uh, do you design your knives or oh, or, yeah. or yeah. do you Yeah, like, everything okay. Yeah, the, everything that I mean, years ago, uh, you know, I had some people say, "Hey, you know, I got a drawing. You want to make that?" And when I first started out, I would pretty much make anything somebody wanted. Right. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been a long time since that. I mean, I basically, well, no, no, just... no, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm not making myself clear. What I mean is, do you okay. draw out what you make or do you start oh, with no. a piece of steel and let it kind of dictate where it goes? No, I take a piece of steel and I make it where I want it to go. It's funny. You say it that way. Um, no, I, I don't draw anything out. Matter of fact, um, it's been years since, you know, somebody says, Oh, can you draw me out this design before you make it? No, I can't draw. I can't draw stick figures. Right. Yeah. You're not going to buy this knife if I draw it for you first. Yeah. If I draw it out for you, I'm losing customers left and right. <laughs> Just let me make it. If you don't like it, you don't have to buy it. Right. Um, but th that's funny that you say that, let the steel go where it wants. I hear that all the time. And that's usually from Smiths that I've been forging that long. Right. Um, that's why you get a lot of smiths. You know, when they're starting out, they have, you know, blades that sweep up, mm. and because they haven't learned to control the steel, control the tip, and keep it down, uh, stuff like that. You know, you can make the steel do what you want. Uh, I just talked to a gentleman this morning. Uh, that he was having problems getting fish lips on the tip of his knife. You know, where the two corners would kind of stick out and almost come together like fish lips. Mm -hmm. And he's like, how do I prevent that? I said, well, right now you can grind one of those fish lips off, but if you use the horny anvil and draw that steel out instead of using the flat all the time, you can avoid that. 
So it's just a lot of experimentation. You can make the steel do what you want to do. Right, right. I think that let it dictate where it wants to go is a common sort of creative trope. You hear writers say that a lot. Oh, you know, she just, the character just wrote herself. Well, I, I get what they mean. I get what they mean, too, because I've listened to a lot of Stephen King interviews, uh-huh. and, I, and I get it, but no, you wrote it. The character doesn't really exist. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. It's like you can't pre-make or pre-design a knife. It does come to you at some point, but uh, it is your idea. So why do you make knives? It's It seems like a hard road to hoe. So is it the creative process? Is it the knives themselves? What what do you get out of it? Uh, it was because when I was younger, I couldn't afford a good knife. So I figured I'd make my own. And uh, I went to a knife show in Virginia and bought a blade and bought a piece of stag and some brass. And I put a knife together. I was like, wow, this is really kind of cool. I wonder if I can make a blade instead of buy one. So I started, you know, take, you know, going to flea markets, buying old bayonets and old knives and trying to clean them up. And, you know, I've got multiple bayonets that are never going to be used for bayonets again because I was practicing my fit and finish. And I was actually, you know, plugging the slots and plugging the, you know, the buttonholes and everything, you know, just making that I was crazy about fit and finish. I was like, everything's got to line up because I saw a lot of knives even when I didn't know anything where it's like, you know, these are really kind of wonky square handles and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, then I decided, well, okay, that's no more fun. Uh, let me try making a blade. So I started grinding blades out of files and saw blades and stuff like that. And, you know, then that was no fun. It's well, let's try forging a blade. And it, it just snowballed out of control. Um, I, it was just a hobby. It was just a hobby. I enjoyed, uh, it was a stress reliever, especially when you, know, you start banging on steel. Mm-hmm. Um, very kind of therapeutic. I mean, I've, I've dealt with several you know, veterans and veterans groups mm-hmm. that use forging as a you know, relief for you know, PTSD and stuff like that. So it's a very therapeutic process. And then after a while, it was like, you know, so-and-so asked me to make a knife. Okay, I could do that. And then a couple more people did. And then after a while, it was like, well, I can actually probably make knives part-time and work part-time. And then after a while, it got better. And I was like, I think I might actually be able to quit working for other people, which is a good idea because they don't like me there anyway. Because <laughs> I'm a little too honest and bosses don't like honesty. That's why I went through a lot of jobs. Um, and it just, it, like I said, it just snowballed. It snowballed out of control. I mean, you know, uh, then I joined the ABS and, you know, then the collectors, you know, got more and more affluent and more and more you know, free money. And, mm-hmm. you know, just uh, then I got on the show and it's just been, it's been great. So who, who is your customer and who, who ends up buying your knives and what do they use them for? If you have any idea? Uh, a lot of them, luckily for me, and I think this is lucky. A lot of my customers still use and carry my knives. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of collectors. I mean, I, I, <laughs> from like 15 years ago, plus, the worst thing I heard was when somebody bought one of my knives and they said, don't worry, this is never going to get used. It's going to go in a safe. <laughs> Seriously, why did I spend three days heat treating that blade if you're never going to use it? Don't worry, after the apocalypse, someone will come across it and they'll use it. Well, that's the other thing, too. I've had you know people like, uh, I don't know if you call it theater or um, rendezvous. They're just pretending. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, you don't need to heat treat it or anything. I just want, it's like, no, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to put my name on it. And if it's not a heat-treated usable blade, uh-huh. you're going to kick the bucket someday. It's going to go to somebody else. They're yeah. going to try and use it, and it's going to be a piece of garbage. And they're going to say, hey, Jay, Jay Nielsen makes garbage. This guy doesn't know how to make a knife. Exactly. It's like, I'm not doing that. If, if you're asking for all of that, why would you pay Jay Nielsen money when you could go to Walmart and get a, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. A Forge and Fire ch- kitchen knife set. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. God, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> I, yeah, I saw that, and, and I was just like, well, good for them, and, and kind of swiped quickly. <laughs> merch, okay, fine, merch. I, I actually went to the, because I'm in Connecticut now, I actually went to the mall across the street, and they have it as seen on TV store. And I not even, not only did I look, I asked the lady behind the counter, where can I get these? <laughs> did she have, do, do you know who I am? <laughs> I practically No, she had no clue. She she had no clue about the show or anything. It's we're we're kind of a niche market there. Right. But, right. Uh, oh yeah, I'm well aware of that. The executive producer on the show, I told him. I said, "Can I get a set of these?" 
Will they send me? They have some guy in the commercial testing. Why can't I test him? He's like, they're never going to send them to you. Please don't do this. I was like, I'm going to get a set of these. I'm going to test them. <laughs> and I'm going to video it. And he's like, oh, my God. you're. So <laughs> he's like, please don't do this. Yeah, I'm, let's let's show the but let's let's drop the veil. <laughs> Again, this is why I went through a lot of jobs when I was younger. <laughs> it's that honesty thing rearing its ugly head again. Yeah, it's just too it's just too bad. It's just too honest sometimes. So, social media how how have how do you see it affecting the knife world? Oh, it's it's a huge boost. I think the only the only issue I have sometimes is like YouTube videos. Um, I mean, I've done some. And there's tons of great information, but you got to take it with a grain of salt. Um, you got to take information from somebody that you know was reputable. It's just like buying a knife. You got to know. You got to you know listen to the people who have a good reputation, um, and not just witchcraft. Great example. Uh, we had a guy. Uh, we had. A, there was a show that came on right after we did. Um, I think it was called Stone and Fire or Ice and Fire. Well, whatever. But it was a guy, he was actually became a contestant on the show. It wasn't an episode I was on because as soon as I watched the episode, he walked out. I was like, I know who he is. <laughs> but the one episode I watched was he was making a Cable Damascus dagger. And I'm like, oh, cool. I want to watch this. And then he started spouting out all kinds of crazy stuff about having to quench Magnetic North. Otherwise, <laughs> the blade was going to warp. And I swear to God, I got emails for six months about this. And it's not even my show. Oh my and it's God. like, I tell people, it's like, look, if the magnetic polarity of the earth is going to be strong enough to warp your little four inch blade, I don't know how we have airplanes. Yeah, right. Right. It's going to tear the braces right out of your son's mouth, man. Yeah. I told him, I said, look, my quench tank for it's south, south, southeast. Okay. <laughs> I haven't had a problem. And then the other thing about you know, the, the Damascus has serrations after you etch it that makes it cut better. And then he etched the blade and then he polished the edge. Well, where are the serrations now, buddy? Oh my God. It was just, it's like, I made it halfway through the episode. I had turned it off. Uh, <laughs> so it's stuff like that that drives me crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, I, I, I sort of get the wanting to adhere to the, the woo woo of pointing it in a certain direction. If it makes you feel better, you know, sometimes it's just like crossing yourself or doing something that yeah. that makes you feel better. But I mean, come on as an instruction, that's, that's kind of absurd. Yeah. If you want I mean, to do it for yourself, you want to throw salt over your shoulder and stuff like that. That's yeah. fine. Don't tell, don't tell everybody that else. That's the way you got to do it. So can you learn forging from watching YouTube videos? Uh, yeah, you can. I mean, you know, there's there's a couple, there's several contestants that come on the show and said, I watched your, you know, Jay, I watched your Canister Damascus YouTube video and that was a huge help. Um, so, yeah, you can. I mean, there's there's good info. But like I said, you just have to make sure, you know, who you're getting the info from. Um, that's one of the reasons that I did the DVDs that I have. I get, you know, the DVDs and digital download both because when I first started out, there was some knife making instruction. There were some knife making books. I ran into certain makers that would leave out bits and pieces here and there. And I think that was like an ego thing. It's like, I don't really, I'm going to try to teach you, but I'm not going to show you everything. Yeah. It's like passing down the recipe, but leaving out the main ingredient. Yeah. That torqued me off so much when I was starting out and I can't do a ton of classes and stuff like that with trying to make knives, spend time with my family, and do the show. So that's why me and Chris Crawford got together and did the DVDs. And I don't BS anything. I mean, I just talk in straight, plain English, which I think everybody knows by now is the only way I talk. Because <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't, I don't uh, mince words on the show. Uh, and I don't mince words in real life. So I just, I just spell it out step by step, you know, from lighting your forge to putting the final edge on your knife. I don't, I have no, I have no need of making myself seem smarter than I am. Everybody knows who you are and, and it's obvious from, from your credentials and from the look of your knives and, and from your work on Forged and Fire that you, you're a man of experience. You know what you're talking about. You're a master. That's one of the things I tell people. I get people all the time that are just starting out. Two key things I tell them when you're starting out, Go visit as many master, well, not master smiths. Go visit as many smiths as you can. Mm -hmm. If you can find ones that you're attracted to the style of knife they make, even better. But go see as many as you can, because so many people go out and start spending money on tools, and then in six months find out they didn't need them. Mm -hmm. 
So go see Smiths, ask them what they do, ask them what tools they use the most, and you know, guide yourself with that. You don't need a ton of expensive tools. I mean, I started out with a block of steel and a five gallon bucket of sand, a little charcoal crank forge, and a one by 30 grizzly grinder. And I actually did my first couple shows with the stuff I made with that. So, I mean, if you can get tools when you get you know, more money, more experience, great, but you don't need them. No, no, that's that's a great uh, that's a great self-imposed hurdle as well. I'm going to start as soon as I get my awesome two inch by seventy two inch grinder, and uh, I'm just going to wait till I get that really awesome forge I'm looking to get, and then I'm going to really dig in. Or you can build your own forge. Yeah, I mean, my my, my point being is is using using the tools as a, a reason not to start is uh, is something I'm familiar with. <laughs> okay, so, uh, I got you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember, I remember going to a nice show and the first grinder, first two by 72 grinder I had was a Grizzly. And like I, I said, thinking this was years and years ago. And there was a, like a group of guys standing in front of my table and they were just chit chat and I wasn't in the conversation and they were talking about grinders and they were talking about, Oh, this grinder, the KM, uh, KMG is back then of it, the baiters and this and that. And uh, they just out of the blue, you know, they were talking to, you know, talking smack about the Grizzly grinder, which it has its issues, but, I could afford it at the time because it was only like two hundred and twenty-five dollars. Right. And they looked at me, Jay, what do you use? I looked at them, Grizzly. And they were like, Okay, we're gonna shout now. <laughs> well, yeah, it's just like you know, uh, you don't need a five thousand dollar tool to be to have talent. You don't need a five thousand exactly. dollar tool to be good at what you're doing. You just need a lot of hard work and practice. Well, it's not. I mean, and I get this every once in a while on the show too when I listen to the interviews, and sometimes you get people that blame their tools Mm. it's not the tool's fault yeah you know you you need to use the tool correctly or you have to make it work correctly for you like the grizzly like i said there's issues with it but there's modifications i did a video uh, not that long ago on okay if you want to use one of these here's some few things that you need to do to make it work better for you that's that big tall grinder right yeah the green one it's got the spindle on the other end yeah yeah yeah, I call that the insto stop because I'm impatient, so I reach over and just grab it, and it stops. <laughs> so, uh, where do you see the knife world headed? Seeing as it's seen such a a, a positive kind of upward uh, trend, um, I, right now, especially after talking to people that just came back from the blade show, um, it, it seems like there's an overwhelming amount of new people making knives. Um, that are new people knives. They're they're rough. They're rough. They're not up to snuff. Um, But I've seen the same thing for years in this industry. You get people that get interested in it. They stick with it for a year, two, three, and then disappear. And I think we're right now, we're in a surge of we've got knife makers just coming out of the woodwork. And then, you know, they're going to filter down. And then the ones that can actually do good work and make a good reputation for themselves, they're going to stick around. And they're going to, I've seen this also, the younger Smiths push the older Smiths. I mean, I've some, seen so many young Smiths on the show. It's like, it's yeah. amazing what they can do. Yeah. And it's like, wait, wait, I got to get back in the shop. I, I spent too much time on this set. These kids are going to be out doing me. I'm going <laughs> to have to watch amazing. my own DVDs to figure out what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, so uh, how, how familiar are you with the folding the folder world. I don't know if that's a, if that's, uh, if you consider that different, if it's, uh, you know, on your radar. Uh, the, the folder world's a whole different beast. Um, I, I've made a few folders way back, um, but it just didn't tickle me. Mm-hmm. Um, I understand the folder being a big deal. I really do, because there's a lot of places you can't walk into the grocery store with a 12 inch Bowie knife on oh, your head. Oh, hell no. No, no. Exactly. Uh, where I live, I can. <laughs> Oh, lucky man. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm used to living in like Virginia, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, you know, you know, you're either walking around with a big knife on your hip or a pistol. As long right. as it's out in the open, you're okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I made a couple folders. I thank God, if they're floating around out there somewhere, I don't even want to see them. But, <laughs> Take my name off them. <laughs> oh, there's, there's been times where I've gone to knife shows and seen, seen some of the knives I made way back when I first started. And it's usually knife makers I know that go, ha ha, Jay, look what I got. It's like, <laughs> how much you want for that? How much <laughs> you want for that? I'll buy it back. And then they end up at the bottom of Susquehanna River, which is the bottom of the hill where I live. <laughs> it's like, nobody's ever going to see this again. Right. But uh, no, the folders, folders are great. I mean, I, I carry a folder. 
I got a folder in my sling bag, which I carry with me all the time. And that's basically because, you know, in certain situations, you don't want to pull out, you know, a five inch hunter and start, you know, cutting up your food or something like that. Uh, the, the reason I ask is because, you know, we're talking about, uh, you, you mentioned a glut of new, a glut is kind of a, not a positive term, but, you know, you mentioned a whole bunch of new knife makers. It's kind of the same uh, I'm seeing in the in the folder world, which is kind of more where, where my collection resides uh, on the whole. And it's it's this, um, you know, f- uh, titanium frame lock um, with the super steel, you know, the, the two three hundred dollar knife thing. And mm-hmm. and m- there are just a bunch of companies out of China, a number of companies out of China making super high quality, high fit and finish knives. And on one hand, they're doing this great thing because they're making the the work of designers that would be otherwise inaccessible, accessible to guys like me if I want to, right. you know, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I like that. Uh, but at the same time, it also, I, I don't know, I, I, I uh, Sometimes I go back and forth in my head as to whether that reduces the value overall of, I don't know, of the design. I'm curious what you think about that. Just that sort of taking taking the the work of a of a um, of, of an artist of a of a creator like a knife maker, and then uh, that's meant to be a custom thing, and then and then mass producing it. We've actually seen the same thing with fixed blades. Um, Several years ago, there was a new term came out like semi-production, uh, where it would be, you know, a bladesmith's design. Mm-hmm. It would get everything. It would get machined and milled and heat treated, and all they had to do was come back and assemble it and clean it up and put their name on it and stuff like that. And it didn't really last. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'm just, I, I'm sure there's still a few more out there. I don't really look at the cheap knife catalogs anymore. Um, I stopped getting them for some reason. Maybe they don't like me. <laughs> but yeah, we did have a bunch of that happening. Um, and it kind of drifted off for the fixed blade makers because uh, it's more about the the crafting by hand and stuff like that. Right. Um, just like I get people to say, well, are you going to be making my knife or is an apprentice going to be making my knife? Oh, no, I don't have any apprentices. I do everything myself. Um, trust me, you don't want to work with me in the shop. Nobody does. <laughs> <laughs> I love my son to death, and he's even got a time limit in my shop. So, right, right. Um, but for folders, it's a different story because there's a lot of machining. Yes. Um, we've even had some young smiths that were on the show, and I've watched them on Instagram, and they're buying, you know, CNC milling machines and stuff like that. I'm like, first of all, how the hell can you afford that? And uh, how do you run it? I have no clue. So, yeah, I you know, think, I think folders, you got to know computers, it's, it's a man. It's different beast. Yeah, it's a different beast. You have the, you have the, you know, moving parts. I mean, I personally, I don't really trust a knife that bends in half. So, mm. I mean, I do it to knives on the show all the time. I don't want to be carrying that. Right. <laughs> That's a funny way of putting it, bending it in half. But, yeah, it's but locked they, open, I mean, I they do. You know, locks can fail, stuff like that. I've known people that have you know, lost fingertips you know, from faulty locks and stuff like Oof. that. Um, but, no, there's a lot of good stuff out there, too. And I actually, I actually just mentioned this week, I said, yeah, look, we really need to do a folder episode. Yes. Yeah, just to change things up. Oh, I loved when you, you had know? the Navaja on, and you, uh, you did a Navaja, the Spanish, yeah. big Spanish. I mean, you also did the, um, you did a couple of friction folders. I think you did. We did a couple of friction it. folders. Yep. Yeah. Yep. One, those of those, cool. one of those bit me real good. Hey, let me ask you, I was just speculating the other night uh, with my wife when we were watching the show. Um, the first round knife is, the blade is always noticeably large to me. Yeah, we usually go between, you know, Nine and nine and nine and eleven inches, you know, eleven to thirteen, and like fourteen to sixteen. And usually, depending on the materials and the test, um, is usually how you know I try to determine what we're gonna do. Uh, um, okay. It's not always in my hands anymore because um, yeah, we got we I mean, like I said, we've been on seven seasons. Yeah. I mean, we got we got cameramen. It's funny when we first started, I'd be calling stuff out and pointing to the cameramen. And they're looking at me like, what the hell is he talking about? And then they turn and what I said would happen. <laughs> and they're looking at, how the hell does he know? And, you know, it's not editing. It's just the fact that I made all those stupid mistakes when I started out. So I knew, right, right. You, know, you keep doing that, this is going to happen. And we've got cameramen that have been here since season one. And they, you know, after three or four seasons, they're flagging me. Jay, Jay, look what he's doing. <laughs> look what he's doing. <laughs> 
<laughs> these guys <laughs> learned through osmosis. That's and we got cool. these guys, they are dying to jump off the camera and get behind the anvil. So I'm actually pushing for a crew episode. Oh, that'd be awesome. I'd That's what I that. think. I mean, they are dying. They would like, they're like, okay, I'll just, you know, you could have a shout out to the judges table if you're not, if you're confused about something, but you're on your own. I'm going to say it right now, since we're talking about uh, various challenges. Um, uh, I mentioned to you in an email recently, I'm dying to see a barong uh, challenge. And, it's and, coming. and for, oh, sweet. And frankly, surprised. Yeah. All right. All right. And I'm just going to stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sucker. For Actually, that. I get suggestions for things all the time. I bet uh, you the do. one that kills me is the judges episode. It's like, oh, okay, I, I understand you guys want to see us okay, oh, calm okay. down. We'll figure yeah, out yeah. something eventually. But you know, the yeah. fact that we we only right now have three foraging judges makes it a little tricky. And then who's going to judge? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, don't 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 let the hoi polloi push you around, Jay. <laughs> God, no, I ain't worried about it. <laughs> well, I've had people ask me. Said, well, would you compete? I said, yeah. Well, what if you lost? So what? I watch Bobby Flay. He loses all the time. What do I care? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like you're a boxer. You're going to go out and box. You might get knocked out. You know, that's, yeah. that's the it's game. Like I, 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 I totally respect Bobby Flay. I think he's great. If he loses, yeah. why would I? It's not an ego thing for me. Right. That's one of the reasons I don't go out and you know, do all the like the nice shows and looking for the not, adoration is not the right word. I don't know what to call it, but uh, you know, I don't need the pat on the back. You know, I just I enjoy what I do. I'm inspiring people with the show to an extent. I'm teaching people with the show to an extent, and I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I make knives, and I got a great life. So yeah, I got no qualms. I got nothing to be worried about. Well, on that note, sir, thank you so much for coming on to the Knife Junkie podcast. I really appreciate your coming on and spilling it with me. Yeah, no problem. I enjoyed it. That's uh, I, I cannot wait to uh, well a to see the Barong episode, but to keep plowing ahead. I, I think I mentioned to this uh, this to you before we started recording, but uh, I feel like the show just keeps getting better and better. And uh, you know, a- as a as someone who does a lot of video editing, I also think the editing has gotten even better. It's always been great, but now it's even better. So oh, they they've got new stuff coming up. We just got a, a gimbal or what a gimbal oh, or whatever. You, mm-hmm. So they're playing around with that. So you know, a couple of our camera guys are working with that. Um, and yeah, we've got some. We got some new effects and some new tests, and we've got a couple of episodes that are going to mix things up a little bit. So, yeah, it's going to be fun. I mean, I, I did a interview for the History Channel years ago, and it's like, you know, season one, we were here. Season two, up here. Season three, we're pushing the bar even higher, and it's bar is getting higher and higher. Awesome. Awesome. We'll keep at it because uh, you got a lot of people loving that show. So, oh, I Jay Nielsen. That. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show, and I uh, hope to talk to you again sometime. Sounds good. You just let me know when. All right. You got it, sir. Take care. All right. Thanks a lot, Bob. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. And we're back on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Jim, the Knife Newbie person, along with Bob, the Knife Junkie, DeMarco. And, Bob, I'm going to ask you a key takeaway f- uh, that you thought from the interview. But I got to tell you, one of the things that I took away from the interview that I didn't know about the Knife Junkie, Project Runway. <laughs> really, Bob? <laughs> All right. Okay. 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 I, I think maybe even in the interview, I played down my interest in Project Runway. Uh, Jim, I actually love that show. And every uh, every season, Mrs. Knife Junkie and I uh, look to see, you know, if the new show has begun. Yeah. I started watching it when I worked in the fashion industry some 10, 15 years back. And, uh, you know, I'm an artist myself. I like to watch these uh these uh, creative competition shows. Why am I justifying this to you, Jim? <laughs> an awesome show. I'm just giving you rope, man, letting you go. <laughs> but they made it even better when they yeah. made it about knives. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and I must admit, uh, when Jay talked about uh, the um, the cooking channel, I think the show uh, Chopped. Mm, yes. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, I love that show. show. I love that show. Uh, Junior Chopped is a big one in this house. I'm like watching oh, okay. these nine-year-old kids competing like adults on the show. I'm like, man, these kids are peaking too early. I, I can't cook anywhere near the kids. Anywhere yeah. near. Oh man, boil water and grill a steak. That's probably yeah. about my uh, about my uh, my limit. Uh, your takeaway. What what you what do you think? What was your key points, highlights, et cetera? Well, you know, it was just it was uh, great to talk to him and get the inside scoop of what it's like working on Forged and Fire and what his career has been like and what his uh, his daily grind is like. But the thing that really resonated with me is, you know, here's a another person 
we seem to speak to a lot of people like this on the Knife Junkie podcast, but here's another person who's following his passion. And, uh, you know, that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, uh, it's not an easy thing to do to break out and become a knife maker. You know, it's a, it's a hard road to hoe. And, uh, but here, here's a man who's following his passions and, and things are working out for him. And it's having a ripple out, you know, beyond himself and beyond his family. You know, when he was talking about how he's received letters from parents saying, my, my child, you know, never came out of the basement, you know, in the, in the basement, just doing whatever and uh, playing Xbox or whatever. And now, now they're, they're, they have some variety in their activity. Now they mm-hmm. want to forge blades mm-hmm. and that made him feel great. Felt great to hear. So, uh, I don't know. To me, that that's that's what I take away from this. Follow your passion. If your passion happens to be knives, it doesn't matter. It could take you down that road uh, right. to where you're not only uh, making your life better, but making other people's lives better. Well, and you, you never know how one little thing will make an impact, make a huge impact in someone oh. else's life. And like you said, you know, just having a kid, you know, put down that video game, get hands on with something and become passionate about it. No telling what that kid will then become, who will then touch, and et cetera. So Ripple was a great way that you you put that. Yeah, he, he was a great guy. I, I really enjoyed talking yeah, with him. And yeah. and on the show, he's got a very uh, sort of uh, uh, stolid exterior, but uh, man, he really uh, he was really personable and great to talk to. So. Yeah, yeah, great interview, great interview. All right. Another uh, great podcast uh, in the books, as we say, the Knife Junkie podcast. And uh, we're going to be back again next week talking more knives. We're not going to spill the beans on what's coming up. You'll have to listen. Uh, I think next week will be a little philosophical. Oh, okay. All right. Can't wait for that. (laughs) For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.